and I'd like to thank Eva and the, the committee for the invitation to speak. And we're absolutely delighted to be able to present the results of some recent and current research on the finds from the remarkable early Bronze Age cemetery at Kilmagadwood near Loch Leven that Derek Hall excavated in 2012 and 2013. And we're very grateful to Derek for supplying us with slides from his dig. And also grateful, very grateful to Perth and Kinross Heritage Trust for funding most of the work that you'll be hearing about today. So, as John said, this is going to be a three-header. Um, I'm going to start by giving you the background information about the excavation. And then Aida will take you through the osteological work that she's been doing on identifying the bones from the urns. And then Nathan is going to take you through some cutting-edge research that he's done on how to sex cremated remains on the basis of their ear bones. I'll then take you through the urns and the artifacts and the other interesting things that were found in them. And I'm going to finish up by discussing the cemetery within the broader context of other early Bronze Age cemeteries in Tayside and Fife. All that in 45 minutes, so hang on to your seats. So to orientate ourselves, here is where the cemetery is located at the northern edge of the village of Scotland Well in Kinross. And it would originally have been closer to the shore of Loch Leven than it is now. Draining in the 18th and 19th century has lowered the um, Loch level. So Derek was called in in December 2012, and it's very cold, to do an initial assessment in advance of building two new houses at the northern edge of the village, just here. And he suspected that there might be something of interest there because an early Bronze Age cinerary urn had been found in the 1940s in the field just nearby, just next to it, and also a number of very important Bronze Age artefacts, including a lot of metal artefacts, had been found and continue to be found in the area. So on the 6th of December 2012, he dug nine trenches, and in eight of them he found nothing except for old plough soil, but in the ninth he came also, which was called Trench 5, he came across the plough truncated remains of four cinerary urns, that's large pots in which bones had been uh, placed, and he could see remains of cremated human bone showing up inside them. They were all buried upside down, and ploughing had sliced off the bottoms of the pots, which is obviously the top as you come down to it. Derek then returned in January 2013 and enlarged that area, and he found another four urns, plus a burnt area at the bottom right, you can see there, which may well mark the former position of where one or more cremation pyre had been. And he returned once again in April 2013 to do a full excavation and to lift the urns and to see if any others were found. So here are the first four urns that he had come across. Here are the next four, and you can see with urn six, all that remained was just a few of the rim shirts. Everything else had been ploughed away. And then he found another. And then he found some others, and these two, 10 and 11, they're also, they're, they're you know, the last remnants. And then he found lots of more, loads more, and it just kept on coming, amazingly enough. So he ended up with 23 urns, so it's an entire cemetery, 23 urns and also three pits that have just cremated bones and not, you know, not, not contained in an urn. And these are numbers, what, 116, 121 and um, 115 on that map there. So well done, Derek. And uh, all the urns had been buried upside down, except for two, which are shown in green on this. And also there was some evidence to suggest that some urns had been buried before others. So these ones with the yellow arrows were in particularly deep pits. And it's clear from the stratigraphy that people had then gone back and they had subsequently put more people in the space there. So clearly we have some time depth to this cemetery. So. He very carefully lifted the urns with their contents intact, and then, unfortunately, no money was forthcoming from the developer for the very necessary, the essential post-excavation work. And so they stayed in storage, first of all in Derek's shed in his back garden, and then courtesy of CFA archaeology for three years 
until Perth and Kinross Heritage Trust was able to raise enough money for the urns to be excavated in, in the lab, in our lab, for an initial assessment for any grave goods that might be present to be done, and also for the bones to be examined by an osteologist. So, over the summer, a team of osteology students from Edinburgh University, uh, led by uh, Kath McSweeney and including Nathan, um, set to and excavated the contents of the urns. And now I'm going to pass over to Aida to tell you about the work that she's been doing on identifying the people whose remains had been buried in the urns. Hello, I'm Aida Romera and I'm the osteologist doing the research on the human remains. Um, some of you may know what the osteologists do, but some of you may not. Um, we osteologists look at the past people by looking at the bones themselves. That includes the excavation, you can see, and more importantly, the following processes, which is the element identification. So in this picture you can see a quite nicely preserved skeleton, kind of tenderly hugging another skeleton on the side. Well, that's a pretty picture and we normally don't find the bones in that condition. Normally they are very fragmented and damaged and it's very difficult to identify the element. So our first job is to identify the bone to which the fragment may have belonged. Once we've done this, we need to um, go on to do the demographic profile of the individual. That includes sex, age, any pathologies, measurements, anything we may know from the bone about the individual. For example, to sex, um, we use the pelvis. It's one of our favorite indicators because for obvious reasons, male and female have um, different pelvis shapes and we look at different things. For example, we can look um, I don't want to go far from the microphone, but you can see the concave, that's um, the pubic, and we look at that very specifically to see um, um, any dimorphism between male and female, and I score them. Also, the pelvis is very helpful for aging an adult skeleton. For juvenile skeletons, we rather prefer to use dentition because it's not affected with um, nutrition, so it has quite a stable and constant development um, that we, like, from today to the past, there's no much difference. And finally is the pathological identification. Most of the pathologies won't show on bones, but some chronic diseases will. That's um, tuberculosis, leprosy, but also general malnutrition. So a child that has suffered malnutrition during his or her upbringing will show that on the bones when he's an adult. It doesn't matter if he survived that malnutrition, we'll see it. So that's quite cool. But what happens when the remains are cremated, like the Kilmacadwood remains, well, um, then everything is more complicated. And it's more complicated because the degree of fragmentation is much more extreme. Um, all the indicators for sex and age are normally um, visible. You can't really see them. So everything becomes more complicated. However, like essentially our job is the same. We do the same. We try to identify each of the elements to which one they belong and try to um, make a profile of the person, of the individual. So, um, work in the laboratory, um, Alison already explained that Derek will lift the arms and touch, take them to the museum after three years, and then a team which Nathan was part of excavated the arms. And that was done by excavating them in speeds so checking each of the levels for any information they could contain. Once that's done, we separated the bones into two categories, the identified material and the unidentified material. The unidentified material, it also makes up to a 60%, 70% of the total, so a lot of unidentified material. But when we find them, we separate them in three categories. One, over eight millimeters, 
another um, eight to five, and the rest five to two. That shows you that it's very difficult to find large fragments. Normally, we don't find anything larger than 10 centimeters, so pretty small. And with the bones that are less than two millimeters, well, we call them residual, which is not very nice, but um, as you can see, it's mixed with pebbles, stones, charcoal, any other thing that from the soil, and it's very difficult to identify them. Um, but the interesting bit is the identified material. And here, full disclosure, um, probably we don't identify them. We pile them into skeletal areas. So long bones, skull, but we don't normally identify in a specific element unless it has been quite unbarred or for some reason well preserved. For example, like phalanges of hand and feet sometimes are quite are unbarred, so we are able to identify them. And finally, the job involved the long-term preservation in the museum for future research. So, um, as I say, if it's difficult to identify the human remains from cremations, how can we um, investigate into the Kilmagadri remains? Well, that's why we need to compile an inventory with lots of different information. So on one hand, the osteological information, which is what I've just explained, but very importantly, type of burial. We already said that this is um, an arm deposit, so the cremated remains were deposited in an arm and then buried. But we also want to know any part there is, fire goods, Alison is going to talk about that, but all that gives us information. And very importantly for the osteologist is the efficiency of the cremation. By efficiency of the cremation, we mean two different things. One is how was the cremation, um, the temperature of the pyre, um, how quickly the body burned, how fragmented the bones were, which is the color, the general color of the bones. All that gives us information about the temperatures and, and how was it done. If you remember the pictures from before, what you see the pyre, so that's what we want to know. And also efficiency of the cremation involves the job of the people that, um, that lighted the pyre and then how they picked the bones. So um, to cremate someone, it's a very long process. You need to create the pyre, you need to light the pyre, um, um, burn the body, and when it's burned, you need to wait for it to cool down. And then pick the bones, place them inside an arm, and then bury the arm. It's a very, very long process, and normally the arms are even made um, specially for the funeral, so, so it's a long process. Um, we want to know how did it happen. Um, did they just pick a little bit of bone and place it inside the arm as a token? Did they thoroughly pick each of the fragments in the pyre that they were able to identify, place them in the arm, and then bury it? So that's all questions we try to identify. So, as Alison said, um, then we all had three first hypotheses. The first one is that arm 12, 13, and 19 belong to a different, um, an earlier stage because they were found in a deeper pit. Alison is going to talk more about that. Um, arm 7, 16, and probably arm 11, although it's quite damaged, you can see in this picture. Um, they were the focus of the cemetery because they were the only ones that were um, found upright. And then the third one is that there was an association between um, small arms and child burials. So that's some of the questions I've got from the beginning. So, arm two was one of the smallest arms excavated. You can see the diameter, only 13 centimeters, pretty small arm, very cute, containing a tiny baby of six to nine months old. Um, the total weight of the arm was only 23 grams, which may seem very little, but it's um, close to the 43% of the total weight you would get in a modern crematorium for a baby of that age. 
So it's very thorough, and you may think like fragments are mainly in the two millimeter seal. So very small, very thorough the recollection of the of the baby. Um, other case, different. Arm number three, a little bit bigger, not not that much bigger. Um, containing um, the only individual that I've so far been able to sex, but only with two indicators. It says that it could be maybe a female, young age, between 20 and 30 years old. And as you can see, 69% of the ideal, the average weight you would get in a modern crematorium for a woman of her age. So again, the, a very thorough recollection of the bones. And then two very interesting cases, R7 and R8. And 7 and R8 are very interesting because both of them are very similar. They are both the same type of arm with the same type of decoration. And the only difference is that arm seven was um, in a bright position, whereas arm eight was like the most of them in an inverted position. The rest very similar. Both of them with children aged between three and years and three years three and six years old. Here you can see some pictures of dentition, a set previously that we prefer to identify the age of juveniles and skeletons by looking at dentition. So this is it. And also by looking at the fusion of their epiphyses. The bones of the juveniles are incomplete. Um, it's only the shaft and then we call epiphyses to the both ends of the bones. So the bone goes growing and when it finally fuses to the epiphysis, that's the full the full size of the bone. So we look at these two things, and by looking at that, I realized they were probably three to six years old. And both of them had more or less the same amount of human skeleton inside, which meant the 42% again, like a huge amount of bone that you would get from a crematorium. So, so far, that's what I've been done. Um, I've looked now to on 1 to 12. Here is only 1 to 9. Um, all the material I've got so far is quite young. Every individual I've been a able to age um, is below 30 years old, and most of them are juveniles, which is a pretty interesting um, funerary place. Not because it's completely unusual, which is not, but um, we normally don't see as many children in a burial. Although the um, child mortality is very high for that time, but we don't, we don't see it normally. And what needs to be done, obviously, finish with the arms, and then conduct further research. Um, it's difficult because it's cremated to do some analysis, but some, um, for example, your university is trying to do isotopes analysis from cremated remains. We'll see. Um, but one of the interesting analyses that's been done, it's been done by, by Nathan Welsh, and he's going to talk about it, and it's about um, aging through the air. So thank you. All right, uh, so good morning. Um, as uh, was mentioned, I am currently doing some research uh, determining sex of individuals uh, by analyzing their uh, the inner ear uh, within the temporal bone. Uh, as Aida pointed out, uh, cremated remains uh, tend to become quite destroyed, and uh, the petrous portion where the bony labyrinth or the inner ear resides is one of the more frequently recovered uh, remains uh, in cremated remains. And that's located within the temporal bone as highlighted here on the skull. And it's located within the petrous pyramid, which is located endocranular within the skull, and highlighted here by the circle. So what I was going to do, and what I, am, what I have done, uh, is reviewing and analyzing this labyrinth by CT scanning these uh, uh, petrous pyramids and uh, creating 3D animations and 3D uh, reconstructions of the bony labyrinth and to, to get the measurements that I needed. And my initial analysis was just to see if I could even do this, if the reconstruction was even possible um, because of the destruction, destructiveness of the cremation process. And then to see if the method that has been recently developed 
to determine sex of individuals um, is viable for this, this, this field. So just a little bit of a anatomy or background, uh, giving you a good anatomy lesson here. Uh, the the pet, uh, bony labyrinth is where the inner ear resides, and the labyrinth is a bony sheet that protects these vital organs that are, reside in there, which are the auditory organs and the autolith organs. Uh, these help us to give our sense of hearing and our sense of balance. Uh, and this area of bone is quite dense to protect it, which is why it uh, survives the cremation process so well. And the interesting thing about this uh, pyramid is that it becomes fully developed between the 17th and uh, 25th fetal weeks, uh, which makes it even possible to uh, uh, give a sex estimation for infants and, and children, which is quite difficult because a lot of the sex indicators uh, don't really appear until later into, adult, uh, into early adulthood. Uh, so a little bit about the structure of the bony labyrinth. Uh, there's three different separate structures. Uh, the cochlea, which is the spiral snail shell, uh, structure right there. Uh, then you have the vestibule, which is a, a bulbous end to it, and which the stapes bone drums against uh, to give us the, uh, our sense of sound. And then the three horseshoe shapes on top of the vestibule, those are the semicircular canals, and that's where I'm mostly concerned about. Uh, these dimensions of uh, the canals are what can be determined uh, for uh, sex of individuals. Uh, typically, the dimensions are larger in males due to body mass being greater in males during birth, and uh, this study is still in the process of being confirmed, and as part of what I'm trying to do is see if this is a viable method, and if it is true. And uh, so for my methods of analysis, uh, I CT scanned these remains. This is a Petrus pyramid from urn 14 uh, in Kalamagagalud. And I analyzed about six of these uh, uh, Petrus pyramids from uh, the Kilimanjaro Group site and another 14 from various sites from Scotland. And uh, so what I did was made a, a map and CT scan of the bony labyrinth. And then I would take the dimensions that are uh, shown here and get those measurements, mostly for the posterior semi semicircular canal and the lateral semicircular canal as these were deemed to be the most sexually dimorphic uh, by Ozipov and his colleagues who done a research uh, on a modern population in Crete of over 200 people and they found that this was a very accurate method. Uh, about 82% of the people that they analyzed were accurately sexed um, based on this method. Uh, but again, that plays into some problems that I can talk about later. So. My initial reconstructions were actually a great success. I was able to reconstruct a, the majority of these bony labyrinths from this cremation, these uh, cremated bone, which was quite surprising based on the destruction of the, this process. And uh, about four, five of the samples uh, were not be able to be reconstructed, but uh, this sample here was probably the best one that I was able to reconstruct, and that's from Ur 19 from the Kilimanjaro site. And uh, I was able to get a full reconstruction. There was some damage, um, some evidence of uh, uh, shrinkage, uh, which happens with cremated remains. And I was able to get a determination of sex from the uh, Petrus portions that I had analyzed. And uh, all but one of the 20 samples that I had analyzed came out female. So only one came out male. Uh, so when the uh, measurements are plugged into the uh, formula, any positive value is uh, going to be a male, and any negative value will be a female. So there's some possible interpretations for uh, why this may be, why so many of the samples came out female. Uh, one is maybe barrel practice, but this is a, a very preliminary idea. Um, it's probably not true, um, where females are typically uh, cremated more often than males, but uh, that is still not uh, a possibility, but what's possible is that uh, the cremation process does cause uh, the bones to shrink up to about 15% uh, of their normal size, and this could influence the, uh, the results that I have gotten and uh, why I had such a high frequency of females. And uh, that's what I would like to continue researching um, in my uh, further education. And again, the other problem would be population. The initial study for the method was developed using a modern population from Crete 
uh, in Greece. So the population differences could also play a role. So what needs to be done is to analyze uh, a specifically a, a Bronze Age Scottish population that hasn't been created to develop a new formula. So here is a 3D reconstruction of the bone. The pink uh, is the bony labyrinth, and the bone that's being built over that, that is the Petrus Pyramid. And as you can see, there is quite some a uh, bit of damage to the bone as it goes through uh, with exposing some elements. And again, this is a, another depiction of it, uh, showing you the exact location of the bony labyrinth within the Petrus Pyramid to give you an idea of the kind of uh, destruction that's also happened to this bone. There are so several areas exposed, which may also influence the results as well. So there's still much I need to do, still much to research. So all of this is part of my master's dissertation currently at the University of Edinburgh. So uh, I will continue to explore this. And eventually what I would like to do is do some experimental archeology span by analyzing um, animals who, uh, by CT scanning their skulls, to get measurements from the, their bony labyrinths, then cremate them, and to see what kind of changes occur to that labyrinth. And then uh, eventually I would also like to develop a population-specific formula for the, these individuals so that the uh, classification can be more accurate. And uh, again, further testing is always needed for these kind of methods. This is a method that's just been recently developed and has only been tested twice. So what I'd like to do is just continue to test that and see how it goes. And uh, I'm going to turn it now back over to Allison for the remainder of the, the Kill and site. Nathan was too modest to say is that he got a, a, a very shiny um, distinction for his wonderful work. Well done. So, quickly moving on to the urns, you have five styles of urn represented, and, and this includes the urn that was found in the next field. So we have a tradition of vase urn, and we think by analogy with dated examples elsewhere that the, the, the date range should be somewhere between 2100 and 1800 BC. We have collared urns, which started a little bit later, but overlapped, so that's about maybe 1900 to 1700. Cordoned urns, which are a variant within North, uh, Northern Britain and Ireland of collared urns, about 1800 to 1600. You have bipartite urns, 1800 to 1600, and then you have these bucket urns that are just bucket-shaped, probably around 1700 to 1500. And if our ceramic typology is right, then we can use this style drift to see how the cemetery developed over time. And I'm delighted to say, Derek, you're right. You're right. There you go. The earliest, stylistically, the earliest urn is number 19 in the nice deep pit, which may be a female. Yeah, if Nathan's right. We hope so. Pa girl power, that's what we like. <laughs> then... All these ones are collared urns, so it's as though it's expanding around that initial focus. Then these are your cordoned urns here, so it's sort of spreading westwards. Then you've got these two here, and then you've got those two there, and it's kind of petering out. Now, what we eventually, if we get the money, and we should be crowdsourcing now, um, we need about 25 radiocarbon dates at 350 pounds a pop, so that's about nearly 10,000 pounds. But having got that, if we are able to get that, we can test and see if this is a correct rendition of the way the cemetery developed. And we can also see how many generations are represented. Uh, I would put my money on maybe, maybe sort of four or five, possibly six generations of the same local community. Now, and putting them in the broader context um, with encrusted urns, you can see here from Trevor Cowie's distribution map, they're widely distributed in the east of Scotland, and so therefore uh, Clamagadwood lies well within the distribution area. This is slightly harder to see, but again, you do get a scatter of collared urns in the rich lowland agricultural parts of Scotland. This particular kind of urn, we think, developed probably somewhere in England, and then the idea caught on elsewhere. Cordon urns have this very specific distribution. It's like a, it's a kind of style drift from collared urns. And you can see there, there's a huge concentration in Fife and in East Lothian as well. And if we're thinking about comparable early Bronze Age cemeteries, um, yes, it's big. Uh, it's not the biggest. Um, uh, 
And also in terms of the interesting di- the, the, the positioning of the urns, this is a particularly interesting one from Westwood near Newport on Tay, which was a, a 19th century discovery that had some of the same kinds of urns. And as you can see here, um, allegedly there was uh, you know, a primary deposit and then a circle around it. In terms of numbers, um, if you go to um, Southfield Farm near Luther's, which, um, uh, which is an extension of Brackmont Mill as well. Very sad story. There's, this is a vast early Bronze Age cemetery that was found at different times by different people, and um, a large number of those urns. So there were 49 pits with cremated remains, including 40 urns, but only a few of those urns ever ended up in a museum. So that's a bit of a, a, a tragedy there. Um, Skilmer Finney in Aberdeenshire, there were 40 pits, uh, including 10 with uh, cordoned urns in. And in terms of the age structure that Aida was, was referring to, if we look at um, a slightly early cemetery from Westwater Reservoir in Peeblesshire, there we found again a high proportion of very young people. So we know that during the early Bronze Age, some people, like the, the kind of men who were buried with daggers, made it into their 60s or 70s. And I love to say that the older you get, the more people respected you in the early Bronze Age. And I think that's a jolly good thing to follow. So if you've made it as far as 40, respect. And if you've made it to 60 or 70, my goodness me, well done. Anyway, so yeah, the urns contained not just the cremated human remains, but also some, a few of them had these lovely, lovely, lovely objects in. So um, items of jewelry and dress accessories, and little, little metal things, but also natural things. So a pupa of a parasitic wasp and some plant seeds, which are very interesting. So, from urn seven, seven, this is a collard urn that had a young child in, age three to six, and there is this beautiful little bone toggle, a little bit like a duffel coat toggle, yeah, where you would imagine it would have, have um, uh, fastened a funerary garment, yeah, and it had been burnt along with the body on the pyre. So, not everybody had one of these, and so this little kitty was, was buried with, with a, you know, degree of decorum and respect. These things tend to be found with both sexes. And also there was an unburnt flint flake. Why was it there? We just don't know. There's a lot we don't know. Urn three had a most remarkable find. So two fragments of sheet bronze in, okay? And the urn was associated with a young adult, possibly female, probably female. It could have been worn as a little necklace or as a bracelet or maybe sewn onto a garment certainly had been through the funeral pyre, so this is burnt metal here. Would have been a very valuable status symbol because any, any, you know, if, any metal there, any bronze, you know, you're, you've made it in society. And it's a very rare find. There's only one other find from Scotland, which was from a hoard in Migdale, um, up in Sutherland, where a whole series were found. And it's thought that these may well have been sewn onto a head garment. And um, if you were to go to Bavaria around the same time, you'd find that that was the height of fashion for women in Bavaria. Um, this, this was uh, reconstructed for Time Team, so that's a Victor Ambrose illustration of a man, because all, the, uh, all of the other finds from the Migdale Horde were sort of macho male type things. So maybe, and I know that Brendan disagrees with me, but hey, <laughs> you're, you're not up here just now. Um, <laughs> we, we know that people were very cosmopolitan, very s- sophisticated, and capable of traveling long distances. And I really do think that people in Eastern <coughs> Scotland were able to, to travel to the continent and to pick up fashion tips. And of course, back here, they wouldn't know that this was for ladies, so men could get away with it. That's my hypothesis, and I'm sticking to it. From urn 18, we, we, we joked, we said, well, we've got to find a faience bee. Yeah. So on the last day of the excavation, that's what they found. And faience is a sort of glass-like substance. You may be familiar with it from Egyptian um, uh, segmented beads. And in fact, it used to be thought that Egyptians had come all the way to Britain with their pockets bulging with beads for the natives. And, no. And the real story is much, much more interesting than that. How are we doing? And this too had been through the funeral pyre. So it has lost its beautiful turquoise glaze. And um, it's almost always associated with women. And it's an incredibly rare and precious status symbol. And probably an amulet as well. So this would have been, now when new, it would have been this lovely turquoise color. And this was the earliest turquoise anything in Northwest Europe. And we do think that people would believe that these are magic. They've had the magical power to protect you in life and as you go through this difficult long journey into the afterlife. 
Fascinating stuff. Um, and in urn 12, there were two fragments of burnt bone bead or beads. Um, they don't quite, they've been through the pyre, they don't quite conjoin, but we know that you can, you know, as things burn, they can be, um, they can deform, get out of shape. So it's either one bead or it's two beads. Could be a male or a female possession. They're uncommon, but they're not particularly high status. Interestingly, in the bipartite urn 20, there was a bronze awl, which would have been used if you were um, wearing clothes made of animal hide and you need to make holes in them, you would use a bronze awl. They tend to be found with women. There you go. There. The only of women had probably been burnt, but also there's a tiny fragment of a razor as well, which is a male accoutrement. So perhaps, so uh, hurry up, Aida, we want to know, are there two people in urn 20? There might be. Yeah, and I can't remember, was that the one, Nathan, where you said there's female and male? Yes. Ta-da! The appliance of science. Wonderful. And then finally, we got a bigger part of a bronze razor in urn 15 in a cordoned urn. And so I put my money on this being a, a male in here, probably an adult male. Why? Why razors? You know, you're not going to put your filly shave into your grave, are you? In your coffin, you'd be pretty sad. Except for the man who bought Rem here, Mr. Remington Steele. Um, we know from southern England that people, there was actually a hoard of body hair, which they, they wondered whether people were shaving off either their eyebrows or their beards and moustaches as part of the morning funerary ritual. And in fact, they got the Metropolitan Police Forensic Scientist in to say it's not eyebrow hair, it's definitely a moustache or a beard. So it tells us something about um, clean shavenness and about funerary practices, probably. But, and also, you know, the, the past is very much a foreign country. They did things differently there, you know. No hipsterish beards there. Probably been through a pile associated with men, cordon urns, so a classic association. And then the insect and plant remains. We know the parasitic wasp is capable of burrowing down, so this could well be a modern... Um, we don't know. It could be an early Bronze Age. It could be a modern one. We're not going to spend £350 finding out, I'm afraid. And likewise, the seed pod in the earth, you know, seed pods and things can sort of trickle down. Um, so it's either modern or it's very old. And we need to get a, a, a seed pod expert, which they, they do exist, to tell us what it is. There are some mysteries. So just a few days ago, I either found fragments of it's either bone or antler and it's got this very distinctive linear corrugation in it and luckily in our store we're right next door to the natural history store where they've got loads of um, deer antler and if you look at the bottom of the antler near the crown you'll see that it's it ribbed like this but on the other side it looks more like bone so we have passed this over to our formal osteological chums in our museum to say is it antler or is it bone because if it is bone then it's deliberately decorated and quite important so loads more to do. We need to continue the osteological work to identify the cremated re remains as to age and sex and number of people. Yeah? We certainly need to radiocarbon date them. Yeah? And analyse the awl and the razors just to double check that they are indeed bronze as we suspect and analyse the final speed and yeah, identify the seed pods. Conserve all the artefacts. This is a complete nightmare because the urns may have you know, come out of the ground complete, but a lot of them now are, they are literally falling to bits. If you, if you, if you take the wrapping off, they will collapse. And it's, it, it, it ain't cheap. And also, National Museum of Scotland are not going to pay for this because we are not here to, to bail out developers who don't pay. Um, then publish the final excavation reports. So things need to be drawn, they need to be written up and published. All that costs money. And, um, but hey, thank you very much for listening. And if you've got another, well, £20,000, you know where to put it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.